Is everybody awake out there? Yes, we are. Let's try that again. Out, I, you're awake. I know. I'm awake. <laughs> but are you awake out there? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's that's a lot better. I am. Uh, I'm excited uh, to be here this morning with you. Uh, I'm excited every Sunday morning. I know this is a special day for us um, as pastor in uh, in church, but um, every Sunday is a special day. We, uh, we get to meet with uh, Jesus together as a family and to celebrate uh, his goodness and all that he is doing in our lives. And uh, we, are, we, are truly, we are truly blessed. Uh, we are a blessed people. And so as we, uh, as we worship today, uh, our intention, I know what we're doing and I know what you know, the service is about, but as we prayed this morning, our intention this day is to, is to lift up Jesus and to recognize him and, and to give him praise. I know that God has blessed you this week. You may, not know, you may not realize it, but God has blessed you in some way this week. And, and let us be grateful and thankful and give him praise for it. And we're going to do that right now as we sing together. We're not singing to each other. Remember who we sing to? We're singing to Jesus. It ought to make all the difference in how we praise. Come on, stand and worship with us, would you? This Enjoy the presence of the Lord today, all right? Let's enjoy his presence.
going for it, aren't we? As brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing what our destination is. Praise God for that. You may be seated, and the ushers are going to come now and wait upon you for your tithes and offerings. Sorry, the transition's a little weird today. We usually do some other things before this, but that's okay. Um, Mark uh, had his little hint when he sent out the order of service this week, and he put Heather offertory. And so I was like, okay, that means that I get to do something, I guess. And so I went kind of searching, and this is a song I haven't sung in a while, but I wrote it a long time ago. And um, I felt like it was appropriate for today because... We're here to install Pastor Mike and Laura as our church body and family here to lead us and guide us. And he's kind of like head of our church then, right? But the main thing is that God is head of our church. He's head of our lives. And he is who we live for. And that this song that I wrote um, is just talks about reaching out and our part of what we're supposed to do in this life.
song. And uh, you, you don't know this, but that's going to absolutely go along with the, the things we're talking about today. So praise the Lord for that. It is so good to be with you, isn't it? Happy New Year. I, I know we're about a week into that, but it's a big day. We're here to install Pastor Mike and Laura as is the, is the new pastors of our church. And, um, you know, it's an important day. We, we mark important days, things that are um, um, just things like graduation and, and weddings and anniversaries. And, and, you know, we think about like all these important days and we mark them. We, we do special things that kind of, you know, hey, we put our stake in the ground. And that's why we do these installation services is, is because it's, it's a good time. This is something that we, that we just mark and stake that Pastor Mike is, is our new pastor. And, and all of us, all of us are part of the priesthood of believers. I mean, the Bible teaches us that. But we know that, that when we have a church and, and a church body, a congregation, our pastor is very important. Who They're the person, the New Testament. Paul said this, follow me as I follow Christ. And, and pastors kind of walk in that place for us. And, and we're very, very excited about that today. You know, it's January 8th. You know that. And, um, you know, we're starting the new year. I, I was just thinking, I hope that... Um, you know, 50, what would it be, 51 weeks from now? If you were looking back and saying, what were the best weeks of the year? What, what would, have, I hope this is one of them. I hope this would be a day that you would circle and go, you know, one of the high points of my year was January 8th when we installed Pastor Mike. And, and I thought about that and I'm like, well, that, that could be kind of depressing because some of you would think, oh, is it downhill from here, you know? <laughs> and, and it's not that. We want it to be uphill. But still, this is just a, a great day. So we, we've got things that we're going to do. Um, one of them is we need to make sure everybody has a bulletin. Um, they look like this. It says East Ohio Church of the Nazarene on the front. Is there anyone that does not have one of these? Okay, Bonnie does it, Mark. Um, could somebody help us and, and thank you, and, and we'll get one to you. And because um, inside it, in the middle, there's a couple of readings. There's some things that, that Pastor Mike is going to read. There's some things that we will read together. So we want to just make sure that everybody has one of these. So we have these readings. We have a ritual thing that we're doing. Um, there's some symbolic gifts that we're going to give to Pastor Mike that represent um, some of the roles or, or offices within the church. We're going to do that. Uh, we're going to look in God's word. We're going to take communion. Um, we, we've got another song. And, and guess what else we've got? Food. And, and uh, I'm well aware of that. So don't get nervous. Uh, I know that I've only got your attention as, as long as your, you know, your belly will hold out and because uh, we're going to have lunch together. So... Again, it's just a good day. Well, um, let, me, let me start. I have a, a ritual here that we go through for the installation of pastors. Um, Pastor Mike, would, would you come and, and just maybe, maybe stand here in front of the platform just and, and face the congregation? For 20 centuries now, in every generation, the church has set aside some of her members for special training and preparation, ordaining them to serve as clergy. She elects them to positions of responsibility, not privilege. They are to serve the needs of the church. These ministers give up their lives, so to speak, for their lives are not their own. They serve if and when and where and in the capacities that the church invites them to serve. They are the servants of God. Pastor Mike, will you accept the charge to be the spiritual leader of this flock? If so, would you answer, I will? To you, the congregation, will you, the members of this church, accept, support, and uphold Reverend Mike Kimball as your pastor? If so, answer, we will. We will. Wonderful. 
Um, I mentioned about gifts, and we have some people that are, are going to be participating. Let me tell you how we do this. There's, um, um, I'm going to call you up as you represent certain things, and uh, you'll have a gift that you give Pastor Mike, and, and it represents some of, the, um, some of the... So the first person, are you representing the Sunday school classes and discipleship? Okay, let me hold the mic for you here, or, or you can hold it and, and um, present that to Pastor Mike. Accept this Bible and be among us a man of one book, as Mr. Wesley said, in this place we want to claim to claim the word. Thank you. The next person we have is representing part of our church board, the stewards. Thank you, Dale. Receive this vessel of water the water of baptism. Be among us an evangelist who brings many to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to the affirmation of faith pronounced by the baptismal water. Thank you, Dale. Next, we have a person representing the worship music in our, our worship ministries of our church. Receive this hymnal and be among us a leader worshiper at the foot of the cross that we may worthily magnify the name of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks, Tom. Now we have someone representing families in our church, the young families in our church. this directory containing a list of all our families we are all your people pray for us and be a priest and pastor among us that we might be acceptable to the Lord thank you That's <laughs> we have another person representing the leadership of our church Receive this soil and be a healer and reconciler among us and a model of spiritual leadership to those of us training for ministry. Thank you, Thank you Bonnie. Now we have someone representing um, some of our other families in our church. Um, accept this manual of, of the Church of the Nazarene and the duty of teaching and displaying the, displaying this people in accordance with our, with our articles of faith and agree polity. Thank you, Noah. Pastor Mike is the district superintendent. I have this cup which represents the authority to administer the sacraments um, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your bulletin, if you go into the very middle, there's a section that's called the Pastor's Covenant. And Pastor Mike, this is a covenant that he's making um, to us as the congregation, and he's going to read that to us at this time. In response to the gracious call of God, in gratitude and confidence you have expressed in me, I receive this charge of pastoral leadership. I pledge to you a stewardship of your confidence and covenant with you. Make ours a living, effective church. The church in which sermon and sacrament are based strongly in the word. You live in a dynamic presence of the Holy Spirit. A church with the atmosphere of expectation of conversions. A church where the tempted are surrounded with victory. A church where the redeemed are enabled to see a larger need of Christ in cleansing fullness, a church where the particular consolation of God are given to the afflicted, a church where Christian men and women begin, even on earth, an authentic Christian community, a church that constantly bears toward the whole world 
with sacrifice, its heart and conquest and its purpose. I pledge to you the stewardship of my responsibilities as pastor, to live before you with integrity and Christian simplicity, the responsibility to administer the affairs of the church in consultation and cooperation with the church board, the church staff, the people of the congregation as we carry out the work of ministry for edifying of the body of Christ, to lead you in worship as a worshiping leader, developing a careful regimen of study, prayer, reflection, and preparation for the purpose of personal growth in ministry, to encourage you, to comfort you, instruct you, challenge you by the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments, to seek always to seek always and in all appropriate ways to expand the borders of the kingdom of God, cooperating with the district, the general church of the, church of the Nazarene, and fulfilling the worldwide agenda. To live my family role responsibly, giving my wife care, love due her as the gift of God to me. To listen carefully to you, to care deeply for you, to work closely with you, and to pray daily for you that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, to be a servant leader after the example of Christ. Pastor, having committed yourself to this work, I charge you to care alike for the young and old, the strong and weak, and the rich and the poor. And by your words and by your life, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Congregation, since you have willingly and prayerfully considered and called Pastor Mike Kimball to work among you, I charge you to willingly and prayerfully support, cooperate, and work together with him in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you both serve. Now, in your bulletin, again, on the opposite page, you'll see the mutual covenant between pastor and people. And would you stand with me and all of us together, us as the congregation, Pastor Mike, um, will read this in unison. We shall strive to cooperatively create and sustain an effective ministry that shall renew, renew and strengthen each, each member of this community, community of faith. We, we shall actively seek and welcome into membership all persons without regard to their economic or social status, race, or nationality. Or nationality. We, we shall accept our responsibility for moral and spiritual development in our community, living by Christian standards of good citizenship. We shall work together with other churches and denominations in our community for the advancement of Christ's kingdom whenever we have the opportunity to do so. We shall periodically evaluate our church's fellowship and ministry in light of our mission. If problems present barriers to the mutual effectiveness of pastor and congregation, we shall cooperatively pray faithfully communicate and work in love to find solutions in the spirit of Christian understanding. We shall work to ensure that our church appropriately relates itself to the mission, institutions, and doctrine of the Church of the Nazarene and the redemptive mission of Christ in our community, nation, and the world. Amen. By the power invested in me as the district superintendent of the East Ohio District Church of the Nazarene, I announce to you that having committed themselves to mutual covenants, Pastor Mike Kimball and the New Beginning Church of the Nazarene have entered into a new and solemn relationship, that of pastor and people. Would you please greet your new senior pastor? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, a lot of smiles as, uh, as we, we clap and greet Pastor Mike as our, our new pastor. Hey, well, I want, I want to share with you um, with God's word today, and I'm going to be in the book of, of 3 John. So if you, want to, if you want to turn in your Bible, if you've got your phones or your iPad, it's easy to get to because you just find it and like punch on it and there it goes. Um, if you find it and get in your Bible, it's only about one page and it's, it's right before Revelation. The book before Revelation is Jude 
And then the book before that is, is 3 John. But let me tell you a story before, before we get in, into God's Word. You, you may have heard this story. It's, it's not new or unique or anything. But I think it's a story that, that really um, kind of gets to the heart of why we're doing what we're doing this morning and what some of this is about. There was a, um, there was a college professor and um, he, was, he was teaching his, his class and his course, and, and um, there was a particular point he wanted to make to the, to the class. And so what he did is, is to do this, he, he brought up, and he had a big kind of um, jar or a, you know, a glass. It, it wasn't like a, a fish aquarium, but a big, large um, glass, again, kind of a jar. And, um, and, and he asked the class, he's like, now, now here's the first question, is this jar... Is it empty or is it full? And it was very obvious. There's nothing in it. And they're like, well, it's empty. And he said, exactly. And so he reached back behind and he, and he pulled out these big stones. And he put these big stones or these big rocks in, in the, the jar, in this big aquarium or whatever you want to call it. And he filled it up to the very top with these big rocks. And then he asked the question, is this, is this full or, or, or is it empty? And everyone said, well, it's obvious. It's full. And he's like, oh, is it? And so the next thing he did is he, is he pulled out and he had a, a container that had gravel in it. And he started pouring the gravel in. And the gravel settled in all of those um, like pockets between those large stones. And he, and he shook it around and, and the gravel settled and he worked it and worked it until the gravel was in all of those spots that were around those big stones. And then he said, okay, so is our... Is our our, our jar, is it full or is it empty? And at that point, you know, and, and we've all been there. They're like, I don't know what to say here. You know, is this a trick question? I don't know what we're doing. And, and you know, so everyone's like, mm. um, you know, they just kind of make a noise. And so the next thing he did is, is he pulled out and there was a container of sand. And he took the sand and he began to pour the sand in. And the sand filled all those other uh, spots and in the gravel and in the, the pockets and the big rocks and all of that. And again, he kind of worked it and shook it until, and he leveled it off until the sand came all the way to the top of that jar and, and, um, and, he, and he leveled it off. And now it was full of sand and gravel and rocks. And then one more time, is it full or, or is there room in this? And again, it's like, well, that sand, you know, but again, kind of afraid to answer. The next thing he pulled out was a pitcher of water. And he poured water in, and that water started soaking down. And he got the water to the top, to right at the top. And then the question, is it full or, or is there space in here? Well, what do you do then? I mean, now it's obvious. And the answer is, well, it's full. And so then he backed away. He's like, absolutely. And then the question, the takeaway question, so what, what's the point here? What's the point? What do we learn? And, you know, some people said, well, it's, it's the, there's always room for something else. As full as something seems, there's something else that we can put in. And, you know, there were a lot of those kind of answers. And he said, no, no, you're missing it completely. The point is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in. Isn't that the truth? And I think one of the wisdom things is just kind of understanding what are the big rocks. And for all of us, whether it's individually or our families or our church, you know, we, we, it seems like we, we mess with the sand and the gravel and all of these things. And, and we get distracted and there's all these. But we have to know what are the big rocks? What are the things that really matter? When we gather together as a church and when we do the ministry of the church and all of these things are, are, are the big rocks in the jar. And this is a great Sunday. This is a great time and service to really kind of hit those things. And Pastor Mike, I'm, I'm going to speak to you directly as the pastor of this church about what are the big rocks of this congregation? What are the big rocks of being a pastor? And if we don't get those right, everything else is just stuff. And congregation, I, I, there's going to be a time where I want to talk to you. And it's about us as well. There's things our pastor has to get right but there's things that we as the church must get right. And I can tell you right now, any time that there, there's probably conflict or things go sideways in a church, we can almost always come back to this question. What are the big rocks? Are we keeping those the main thing? Or have we got distracted? 
Have we got sidetracked? Have, have we got off on something else? And that will always, always begin to cause our church to be sidetracked and off balance. So what are the big rocks? Well, the Burke of First uh, of Third John kind of deals with that. Um, Mike, I, I don't know. When's the last time you've ever preached on Third John? It's been a while. Me too. In fact, as I was going through this, I don't know if I've ever church, preached a sermon on Third John, unless it was one of those where it's like, okay, we're preaching through the Bible, and and Third John's one of those books that when you read it, you're like, is there a sermon in here? Um, you know, what do you, what do we preach on in this? And as I was reading some commentaries, what was what some of the things said is Third John is a very interesting book because it's not as as much of a theological book; it's more about organization authority, kind of church structure. There's a lot of these types. In other words, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book that's perfect for a day like this, whereas we talk about the position of a pastor and in, in the authority of a pastor it, within a congregation and a group of people. I mean, it's perfect. It speaks exactly to what we're doing today. He, here was the story, and this is why John wrote this book. You see, in, in that day, um, there, were, there were missionaries that would travel around, and, um, you know, they were, they were spreading the gospel to Gentiles and to Jews. And, and you know, that was their life. They were out um, spreading the gospel. We, we know what missionaries are. And, and when they would come into an area, a church body would, would take them in. And they would support them and feed them and, and do everything they could to help. And they understood that these people are in our area. And, and we're going to do everything we can to meet their needs as they reach the unsaved and the people that need Jesus in that area. Well, there was a person in this particular church. Gaius was the pastor of this church. That was his name, Gaius. And, uh, but there was a, a man in the church that didn't want to support the missionaries. And here's why. His, his really reasoning was, well, how does this benefit us? These people come into town. They're not for us. They're not trying to help us. They're trying to help these people out there. And, you know, we're not getting anything out of this. And if we're not getting anything out of us, why are we putting anything into it? I mean, they're trying to reach those unsaved people. Well, let those people support them. We don't want to support them. And is that an attitude like we often hear today? <laughs> you know, and it's like, so again, if we don't benefit, if we don't get something, I don't want to support it. And again, this very influential person in the church was, you know, that was his viewpoint and how he was trying to influence the other person. And Gaius, the pastor, was saying, no, no, we're very generous. Just as God poured out his grace on us and helped us when we didn't deserve it, we're going to be generous. We're going to do everything we can to reach those people. It's not on them to support the people coming to, you know, bring them eternal life. We're going to do this. So there was this conflict that was going on in the church between Gaius the pastor and this other man. And John wrote this to kind of settle and say, hey, here's how things should work in the church. And pretty much, you know, just to get to the bottom line of it, he said, support the missionaries. Support the missionaries. Because this is what we do as Christians. Uh, we should always be taking the gospel to other people. And it's up to us to make sure that happens. Be generous show grace. It isn't all just about what do I get out of this? What do we get out of this? So anyway, but as he talks to Gaius, and Pastor Mike, this is, is, is what I want to share because there's things he talks about Gaius as a, as a great and wonderful pastor to this congregation. So anyway, here's the, here's the scripture. The elder, which is John, the elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and all that may go with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Uh, kind of another way to say this is, is he, it's like, I hope your health is as good as the condition of your soul. Isn't that a great, you know, as your soul is, 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 is full of love and spirit, may your health be as well. What a great kind of intro. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, let me stop there. There's a couple of just little phrases that he throws out that I, I think all pastors need to hear and to be encouraged. The first thing is this. It's like it's faithfulness. He says that he, was, um, he had great joy 
um, to hear about the faithfulness to the, to the truth. And Pastor Mike, you're, you're called to be faithful as the pastor of, of this church. And we ought to flesh that, that out a little bit. You're called to be faithful. What does, what does faithfulness look like? As we use that word faithfulness, what are some other words that, that describe faithful? What are some synonyms to that? Consistent, dependable, loyal, trustworthy, authentic, solid. Those are, when I just sat down, I'm like, what are, what are words that, that describe faithful? Because we can say faithful, but, but that's a big word, and it means a lot. Pastor Mike, you're, you're called to be a, a pastor who's who's loyal. You're, you're called to be a pastor that's, that is consistent. You're called to be a pastor. There's things that we can, that are faithful. Um, the, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. That's faithful. We just know it. It, it. it goes down early. We know that, but it comes up. As a pastor, we know that our pastor is faithful just as, as the sun comes up and the sun sets. You're called to be faithful. You're called to be loyal. You're called to be um, trustworthy. You're called to be authentic and solid. This church and this community needs a pastor where, it's, where it seems like everything is fuzzy and wavy. We're able to look and it's like, but our pastor's not. Our pastor's solid and faithful. Again, we think of, think of those are words that describe faithful, but, but what's an image that reminds you of faithful? Well, one that probably, I don't know, it's probably sprang to your mind quickly. It's, it's old faithful, right? Out in, in, in um, the national park, and, and there's this geyser. And um, from what I've read, ever, I've never seen it. Wouldn't it be great to, you know, go to, has anyone seen old faithful? Has anyone? Well, I'll make a trip together, okay? <laughs> Every 91 minutes, this geyser shoots up with a power and intensity. In fact, it's so consistent. It's so faithful that you can, you can set your clock by it. There's, there's an app, and it'll tell you, you know, be here because this is when it's going to happen. Every 91 minutes. There's a reason they call that old faithful. Are, are there things in your life? Images or pictures, you could think, this is faithful. Pastor Mike, you're called to be faithful. I know what the opposite of faithfulness looks like. Um, oh, here's a story for you. I, uh, before we moved over here, where, where we lived, we, we had a big yard. Um, out the back, if you went out our back door, it kind of went over the hill, and our, and our yard went out a ways, and really kind of a nice area that it, that it opened up onto. And when we bought that house, I needed a mower, and I bought a mower. And that mower, I, I named it Legion because it was demon-possessed. <laughs> it, it was the worst mower in, in the history of mowers. And Janet would always, I go, I go out to mow, and she's just like, oh, you know, and, and she told me about a thousand times, you need to get a new mower. This mower was the worst. It wasn't new. I bought it used, and, and it wouldn't start. I'd go out to start it. It wouldn't start. And when I would get it started, it wouldn't mow, and it would, it would conk out, and it would whatever. And I fought with that mower, and I, I did everything. And, and, you know, the time when we had that, our, our kids were in school, and, you know, there's a lot of fight. We didn't have a lot of money, and it's, it's what I had. And, and I was just always working on that mower. It was horrible. I mean, like I said, I'd, I'd go out and I'd, I'd mess with it to, to just get it started. And it was like a victory to just get the thing running. And then to, to drive it, you know, you never knew. You kind of look back and it'd be like, oh, I'm here I've been going. And the blades don't turn, the stupid thing, you know, and it had three blades on it. And, and it, was, it was, seriously, it was like it was taunting me. It was like it was making fun of me. Because sometimes this blade wouldn't turn. So these two would, but this one wouldn't. And then, like on the next pass, the two end ones would, and the middle one wouldn't. And you'd have to go back, and you'd have to mow the sections, and you could hear it laughing at you, like, oh, this is so... And, um, oh... At the end of our yard, we had a split rail fence, and at the end of our yard, kind of back behind us was a neighbor, was an older guy. His name was Leroy, and Leroy was a friend. Leroy was a wonderful, wonderful person. Now, Leroy had a mower. He had more 
area than I did. He had a great mower. He had a new mower. That mower would run. It was wonderful. The opposite of my mower. And Leroy, oh, this was just terrible. Leroy would come out of his house, and he'd go to the back of my property in that fence, and he'd stand it, because you know what he'd want to do? He'd see me mow. He'd want to talk. And so he'd be on the far end of the property, and he'd be waving, and I'm like, oh, no, no, Leroy, no. Because if I go to the end of my property and stop that mower, I don't know what's going to happen. And the last thing I want to be is the far end all the way down there, and it won't start again, and I'm a long ways from the house and tools and the garage, and it'd be like, oh, you know, and, and I, <laughs> I'd often have to get down there. Like, Leroy, I'd just go, okay, just a minute, just a minute. And I'd drive it back up close to the garage and get off and walk down, you know, because it's like, oh, I've had to push that mower back. It was terrible. The worst mower in the world. Well, finally... It just, it conked out, the whole deck. And, 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 and here, here was what I always told Janet when she told me to get a new mower. I'd be like, well, I got to work on it, but at least I'm not putting money in it. You know, it would break and I could fix the stuff, but it wasn't like it was costing me a lot of money. And I said, as soon as this mower costs me money, I'm getting rid of it. Well, the deck went out and it was going to cost a lot of money. And I thought, okay, it's time. So I went and got a new mower and they asked me, they're like, uh, so you gonna, you got a mower you want to trade in? And I said, you don't want this mower. I got a mower, but you don't want it. It's not worth anything. Oh, sure, you know, we'll, we'll give you something for it. We can always part it out. Or we got, I said, trust me, trust me, you don't want this mower. And he goes, well, if you don't trade it in, what are you going to do with it? And I thought a minute, and I said, you know, I'm going to find someone that just really annoys me that I dislike, and I'm going to give them this mower. That's what I'm going to do. Well, I traded it in, and, and they gave me a couple hundred dollars. And the new mower, though, oh, my, it was great. I'd sit down, and you'd turn the key, and it would start. And instead of laughing at you, it would be like, you're my friend. You're my friend. And I'd mow, and it mowed so nice. And it just, oh, it was a wonderful experience. And there's times like, you know, I'd say, hey, Janet, I'm going to mow tonight. And she'd say, didn't you mow yesterday? Yep, I'm mowing tonight too. I might mow tomorrow. It's a joy. It's... I was thinking about faithfulness. I don't know why mowers popped into my head. But I even thought about this. You know, we, we know people that are like the mowers I just described. We know people that it's like, oh, everything's a chore. I don't know what I'm going to get. What are we going to get today? How are they going to act? Are they going to be around? Are they going to start? If they do start, are they just going to cause trouble? You know, what are we going to get? And then we got mowers. We got people that are like, it's a joy. It's a joy. And things ha good things happen. And it's a blessing to be around them. Pastor Mike, you're called to be faithful. To be, to be the kind of person, the kind of mower. I hate to describe you as a mower, but from the campground, you get what I'm saying, friend. You know exactly what I'm saying. But the people that do everything, and, and, and they're consistent, and they're faithful, and, and, and everything, and, it, and it's done with joy. And that who, that's who God calls us to be pastors. It says to be faithful. Then it says in first, or third John here, it talks about walking Continue to walk in the truth. And that's very similar, this whole thing about continue to walk. Now, whenever the Bible talks about walking, it's like live your life, okay? To, to, to be a Christian isn't just to sit around, friends. I don't know if you know that, but it's not. To be a Christian and to, and to be who God has called us is to walk in the truth. It's to walk in the faith. It's to walk. And it's living out our faith and it's in our faith and who we are and Jesus is in absolutely everything we do it's in our conversations it's in our work it's in it's in everything it's not just what you say you believe it's what you do is what you believe you see John specifically is saying and that's why you walk if you say you believe something but you don't live it out you don't really believe it in fact, in 1 John, it says this, if you claim to have fellowship with God, but walk in darkness, you lie and do not live by the truth. That's how powerful that is. It doesn't matter what comes out our mouth. 
It matters how we live and how we walk. And we need to line up. This is what John is telling us. What we say we believe and how we live our lives need, need to match and be together. Be faithful, walk in the truth. Now, that word truth is really interesting in 3 John. And, and, you know, circle that every time you see that in your Bible. Now, here's a little bit of trivia for you that I don't know if you'll think this is interesting or not. But the book of 3 John is the only book in the New Testament that doesn't use the name of Jesus. You, you read it, and you can see that there. It doesn't take long to read 3 John. But the name of Jesus isn't in that book, the only book in the New Testament. But you know what is there? The truth. And what the commentators, what, what they will say is, every time you read truth, you ought to read Jesus. Truth equals Jesus. And in today's, I mean, this whole idea of truth, oh my goodness, I mean, for the last how long? You know, we, we don't know what we can trust, and, and this is fake, and this is fake, and this is what, and it's like, you know, how do I know what's true? Well, I can tell you what's true. Jesus is true. And pastor, when it says to be faithful in the truth or to the truth and walk in the truth, it says be faithful to Jesus and, be, and walk in Jesus. Know who Jesus is. We, we ought to know the gospels and, and know who Jesus is. And we live our lives and we lead and we do everything out of Jesus. And as the pastor of this church, Jesus ought to be the center. I was, I, you know, with this being on my mind, the songs that we sang this morning, do you, you know, they're all about Jesus. Everything was about Jesus. The first thing that Pastor Mike shared with us when he got up is, well, we're here today. And guess what we're here to do? We're here to worship Jesus. Jesus is the center of everything. I hope, Pastor, there's so much Jesus in this church that, that you know, someone calls me up to complain. You know, our pastor talks too much about Jesus. Everywhere we turn, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When he talk about something else, I hope somebody complains about that, okay? I'm okay with that because Jesus in the truth are about everything. That's Jesus. Now, John switches gear a little bit about this teaching. And, and, and he's talking specifically to Gaius. Gaius, be, be a pastor, be a person that's faithful to the truth, that walks in the truth. But then towards the end of it, he kind of switches. And remember that whole thing about the missionaries I spoke about? It was like, and treat everyone we come into contact with like they are Jesus. It isn't just Jesus in your heart, but Jesus is out there. The people that need Jesus are Jesus. The people that are in, this, this guy that's given you all the trouble, he's Jesus. Be Jesus to everyone. Be the kind of person that whenever you, the, the worst thing that they can say about you is, well, he's like Jesus. That would be the criticism. And Pastor Mike, that's, as a pastor, that's where we carry. These people in this congregation, they're Jesus. The people that, that aren't in church anywhere today, maybe in these neighborhoods, they're Jesus. Everybody is Jesus and treat them that way. We, we follow Jesus. We treat people like Jesus. Now, here's the other part. So I've been, I've been focused on Mike. Mike's like, would you look at somebody else? Would you talk to somebody else? Well, here's, here's what it says to the church. It, it pretty much says this. Um, hey, everything I, I told to your pastor, to Gaius, it's for you as well. Everything, without exception. Heather, your, your song <laughs> was like right on board with this. You know, it's, it's, God has called all of us to be this. The, the, the hope that John has for Gaius in that church is that, is that the people in the church would be imitators of the gospel and the life that Gaius the pastor led. So friends, for all of you, I, I'm calling you, your, your job in this church is not to just sit in a seat. It's not. You, your job isn't just, you know, and, and Pastor Mike, make me happy. That's not what any of this is about. The role of the pastor is to continue and walk in the truth and it's our job to continue and walk in the truth. John had said, it brings me so much joy when I hear these things of my children. 
And John called all of the people in the church his children. That's how much he loved them and cared about them. But it wasn't just a mandate or a charge for the pastor. It was from everyone. You know this, friends. Our area, our community, it needs a church where Jesus is lifted up and where Jesus is followed. And there's so much Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. And our pastor leads us in that. And, and, and it's our pastor's job to teach us and to lead us and at times admonish us, but to follow after Jesus. And friends, it's our role in that as well to take Jesus to those people, to be generous, to be loving, to understand that it's not all about just us, but it's to love these people whose eternity is at stake so much and they, and they need us. Well, okay. When I read 3 John, the very last verse says this, and, and I'm going to be obedient to it. It says, peace to you. The, um, I'm sorry, verse 13. It says, I have much to write to you, but I don't want to do it with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we'll talk face to face. In other words, that means, hey, I could go on and talk about a lot of things, but I'm done. <laughs> it's time. He goes, this is all we're going to deal with today. And everything we talked about today, that's all we're going to deal with. But he says, they'll come back another time, and we'll talk about some more things. And you know what I want to do is I want to celebrate the victories and the joy and the fruit, the fruit that comes out of the faithfulness of living a life that's all about Jesus. And we rejoice in that. Let, let me pray for you, and, and then we're going to receive communion together. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the hope that is in this word. Sometimes in your word, there's things that we hear and we're, and we're like, you know, what am, what am I supposed to get out of this? But there's a lot of encouragement and hope here that reminds us over and over and over that you have called us, Lord, to follow after you and to help others to follow after you as well. May your joy and peace and spirit and strength rest on our congregation in Jesus' name. Amen.